Praise the Lord, brothers and sisters around the world. Welcome to Lifeline Bible Ministry. Thank you for watching this video. God richly bless you. The Lord did not bring you here by accident. God has a special message for you and for me. The message the Lord has for us has to do with a very critical question. We have, you hear this question all the time. Can you lose your salvation? That's the question we're going to answer today. We're going to look at what is the Bible really saying? The type of salvation we have. Can you lose it or you cannot lose it? Is there a proof someone is saved? And when the person is saved, can the person lose their salvation? That's the question we're going to answer. Once again, thank you so much for watching this video. Please take a moment, like this video, subscribe to the channel if you are not already subscribed, and please share this video with your friends. We all must be blessed by this message. So a quick outline. We're going to look at the nature of eternal life. When I'm saved, the eternal life that Jesus gives me, we're going to take a look at it. Number two, what is the Father's role in our preservation? When I'm saved, will the Father do anything to make sure I remain saved? Will the Son do anything? Will the Holy Spirit do anything? And then we'll conclude this lesson. Now, for each of the segments, we're going to have a one-minute quiz. So get your pencil and paper ready. All right, let's jump into it. We're looking at the nature of eternal life. Okay, we begin with John chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. For whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. He said, whosoever believeth in him, the him is who? Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we have here mentioned eternal life. We have also mentioned everlasting life. Are they the same? Yes, eternal life is the same as everlasting life. But what is it? From this very passage, the Bible is making us aware. If I believe in Jesus, I will have eternal life. I will have everlasting life. To have eternal life means I'm not perishing. Why? Because eternal life is the very life of God. That's why it is eternal. God has no beginning and he has no end. So eternal life means I receive God's very life when I believe in Jesus. That is what the Bible is telling us. So if I believe in Jesus, I will not perish, but I'll have eternal life. If I don't believe in Jesus, I am perishing, and I do not have eternal life. We look at John chapter 6, verse 53, 54. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. What is the Bible saying here? What is Jesus making us aware? Let's break it down from verse 53. Jesus is saying, Except we eat his flesh and drink his blood, we have no life in us. What about those who do not believe in Jesus? Does it mean they don't have life? Yes, they do not have life. Life is only in Jesus Christ. Life, we are talking about life of your spirit, your real man. The physical body moving about, the physical body is your tent, is your dwelling place. 
your real you is on the inside of your physical body. For the real you to have life, we have to eat the flesh of Jesus and drink his blood. Then we will have life. What kind of life is that? Eternal life. And that is what the verse 54 is saying. That whoso eated my flesh and drinketh my blood, that person had eternal life. So if we eat the flesh of Jesus and drink the blood of Jesus, we have eternal life. And Jesus will raise us up at the last day. So do I have to go around sniffing and looking for the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus to, to eat and drink respectively? No. If we go back to John chapter 3, verse 15 and 16, he said, whosoever believed in Jesus has eternal life. That means believing in Jesus is the same as eating his flesh and drinking his blood. There is nothing magical or hidden here. Those expressions mean the same. That means we have literally consumed and received Jesus into our life. So to eat his flesh and drink his blood means we have basically consumed Jesus. We have received him completely. It is not like it's one leg into the, the water, the other leg is out. No, we completely give our life unto Jesus. We receive him completely. Then we have eternal life. Remember, eternal life is God's own life. It is God's life that we partake of. And we partake in God's type of life when we give our life to Jesus. And when we receive him, we partake in God's type of life. And Jesus will raise us up at the last day. Look at what Jesus is saying here. So when we receive his type of life, at the last day, he, Jesus, will raise us up. We go to John chapter 10, verse 27 to 30. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. 29, my father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. What is the Bible saying? What is Jesus telling us? But let's break it down from verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. Jesus is saying, those who are his sheep, they hear his voice. Whatever Jesus is saying, whatever the scripture is saying, that is what they hear. If they do not take what the scripture is saying, it simply means they are not the sheep of Jesus or they do not belong to Jesus yet. And Jesus says, I know them and they follow me. That means the children of Jesus follow Jesus. Verse 28, Jesus says, and I give unto them eternal life. Listen carefully. And they shall never perish neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand so when somebody says they receive eternal life and they can perish that means jesus is the biggest liar that's what the person is saying jesus says the eternal life he gives that individual shall never perish that means shall never perish. If the person could perish, it means Jesus is a liar. He said, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Why can somebody pluck you out of Jesus' hand? God is the almighty God. Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 will tell you that. 
Jesus is the almighty God. Verse 29, my father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. So the father is keeping the believer. Nobody can take you out of the father's hand. Why? Because he's the omnipotent almighty God. No power, no man, no human being can take you out of God's hands. Romans chapter 6, verse 20 to 23. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof? Ye are now ashamed, for the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have fruit, ye have your fruit unto holiness. And the end of your holy living basically is everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Once again, what is the Bible saying here? Let's break it down from verse 20. When someone is a servant of sin, they are free from righteousness. They don't care what Jesus thinks about. They don't care what God cares about. They do whatever. Verse 21. What fruit had ye then in those things, whereof you are now ashamed? A true child of God will be ashamed of any simple past. They will be ashamed of it. They don't go, oh, because I had trauma, so I can do this. No. Trauma doesn't give you the license to be acting crazy. But the end of sinful behavior is death. Verse 22. Say, now you are made free from sin. How? Because of eternal life. Eternal life and sinful living does not coexist. By the power of the Spirit of God, you are made free from sin. And therefore, you become a servant to God. And you practice holiness. And the end of holy living is everlasting life forever. Verse 23, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. What does it mean? It means eternal life is a gift from God. Can you work to have eternal life? No. It has to be given to you. Why? Because it is God's own type of life. That's why it is eternal. You cannot work to have eternal life. We receive eternal life by faith. That's why it is a gift of God. Titus chapter 1 verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Listen carefully. God who cannot lie, promised eternal life unto us before the world started, that we could partake of his life through Christ. That is a promise of God. That is what the Father promised. So when somebody says you can receive eternal life and lose it, that means Jesus is a liar. That's what the person is saying. But the Bible is making us aware God cannot lie. First John chapter 2, verse 25. And this is the promise that he had promised us, even eternal life. Can God promise and fail? No. Can you receive eternal life and lose it? No. Why? If you lose it, it means the very mission of God on earth through Christ is completely broken down. That makes God a liar. That means God doesn't have the power to keep us. Look at Titus chapter 3 verse 7. That being justified by his grace, we should be made highest according to the hope of eternal life. So when we receive eternal life, we are made heirs of God. What does it mean? It means we inherit everything God has. That is the hope of eternal life. 
that we become hers and join hers with Christ. First John chapter one, verse one and two. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, was that the word of life, verse two, for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the father and was manifested unto us. The Bible here is making us aware that eternal life is a person. Eternal life was with the Father and was manifested unto us. The us meaning the apostles who saw Jesus. They bore witness of him. That life was manifested. They saw it. They touched it. They felt it. They ate with it or with him. So eternal life is a person called Jesus Christ, also called the word of life, which was from the beginning. That word of life, that eternal life is Jesus Christ. We look at 1 John chapter 5, 19 and 20. And we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come and had given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So here it is very plain, straightforward. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, is the true God and eternal life. So Jesus Christ is eternal life. 1 John 5, 11, And this is a record that God had given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. So eternal life is in Jesus Christ. That is why if you don't have Jesus, you don't have life in you. We need to understand eternal life is Jesus Christ. It comes from Jesus Christ, and it can never, never be broken. We're going to have our first pop quiz. I'm going to give you 60 seconds for this. Question one, who is the giver of eternal life? Question two, describe eternal life. Question three. Can any person make the true believer lose eternal life? Question four, what is the hope of eternal life? Question five, what is the end goal of personal holiness? Question six, why is eternal life a gift? Okay, let's look at our answers. Jesus Christ is the giver of eternal life. Eternal life is the very life of God we partake of. It is everlasting life we receive by faith in Christ Jesus. Can any person make the true believer lose their eternal life? No, that to make Jesus a liar and not omnipotent God. If you can lose eternal life, that means Jesus is lying. That, that means he cannot be the Messiah, he cannot be the Savior. Question four, what is the hope of eternal life? We become heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. Question five, what is the goal of, what is the end goal of personal holiness? Eternal life for all eternity. Six, why is eternal life a gift? Because no human can earn it. God has to basically give it to us. Okay. Let us look at if eternal life be lost when a believer sins, is it really eternal life? The answer to that is no. That is not eternal life. Okay, we look at Philippians 1 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which had begun a good work in you will perform it until 
the day of Jesus Christ. Listen very carefully. The eternal life that God has begun in you, he is able to perform it until all the way until the day of Jesus. What if God is still able to perform the good work he has started in you? He is able to do that. So the almighty God has power to keep the believer until the day of Christ. So let's look at the role of the father. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In whom ye also trusted. After that, ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that, ye believed. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. What is the Bible saying here? Look at verse 13. When we heard the word of truth and believe in Jesus, something happened. What happened? The Father sealed us with our Holy Spirit of promise. The Father sealed us. What does it mean? What does a seal mean? A seal is a symbol of ownership. Number one, number two, a seal tells of authenticity that whatever it contains is genuine, is true. So the seal of God upon us shows that we belong to God. We have been purchased unto God. And what is that seal that God has placed upon the believer? Is the Holy Spirit. So that's the first thing the Father does. And the verse 14 is saying that it is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. What does that mean? That means God is telling you and me who are believing Jesus Christ that all the promises of God and the inheritance we have in heaven, we shall have them. And the guarantee that we shall have them is that God says, okay, receive my spirit to tell you the promises I've given unto you are true. That's why we become joint heirs with Christ. That is the hope of eternal life. We look at Ephesians 4.30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So somebody says, you can lose it. The person is not thinking according to what the scripture is saying. So our sealing is all the way until the day of our redemption. That's what the seal of God is. God has placed the seal, his seal, who is the Holy Spirit upon us until the day we are redeemed, basically at the rapture time. That means the, Holy, the Father makes sure the Holy Spirit comes to us to secure us in him until rapture. Look at John chapter 10, verse 27 to 30. The focus is on verse 29. He said, because we've read it before. He said, my father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. What does it mean? It means the father keeps the believer in his power. Nobody can pluck you out of the father's hand. Nobody can. Not even yourself. You can't do that. Look at Romans 8, 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep before the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What is the Bible saying here? 
two categories of things which happen to human beings. The first part is situations, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, hunger, nakedness, peril, sword, different things happening in your life that cannot separate you from God. Nothing. That is why in the book of Hebrews or in uh, church history, some people were killed. They were burned at the stake and they were singing hymns to God. You may think they are crazy. No, they are not. The power of God kept them in Christ. That is why no matter what happened, they are still in Jesus. Nothing can move them out from Jesus. In verse 38 to uh, 39, talking about spiritual entities. As for me, I come from uh, Russia. There are witches there. So I will lose my salvation. Who told you that? Nothing. No situations, no spiritual powers. Nothing can separate you and I from the love of Jesus Christ. Absolutely nothing. So the Father's love for us keeps us in Christ. First Peter chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, had begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that faded not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Once again, what is the Bible saying here? The Bible is talking about the Father who is abundant in mercy, and he has begotten us unto a lively hope. How? By the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Take a moment, think again. If Jesus was not resurrected by the Father, there would have been no salvation, no eternal life. So the Father did that so that we can partake in his life. The verse 4. When we receive eternal life, we become heirs of God. The verse 4 is describing what we shall inherit. What we shall inherit is incorruptible. It cannot be corrupted. It is undefiled. It doesn't fade away. It is reserved in heaven for us. Who reserved it? The Father. That's why we inherit the Father. We become heirs of the Father and join the heirs of Christ. Who inherits the Father? Those who are kept by the power of God. So the power of the Father is keeping us eh, unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The Father's power is keeping the believer. That is why nobody can pluck you out of his hand. That's what the father does. Okay. Pop quiz number two, or reflection number two, so-called. Question one, why is the father keeping believers by his power? Question two, why can't nothing on earth take you from the father's hands? Question three, why did the father resurrect Jesus from the dead? Question four, until what time would the father keep us by his power? Question five, why did the Father seal each believer with the Holy Spirit? Once again, you have one minute. You have a minute to answer these questions. One minute. Let's go.
Okay, our one minute is up. Question one, why is the father keeping believers by his power? So his will of eternal life will be maintained. If he doesn't keep us, then we'll lose the eternal life. That means it's not eternal after all. That's why the father will keep us by his power. Question two, why can nothing on earth take you from the father's hands? He is all powerful. That's why he's called omnipotent God. Question three, why did the father resurrect Jesus Christ from the dead? So we can have eternal life. If Jesus was not resurrected, we could not have part, partaking or partook or, or be part of the eternal life that God gives. Question four, until what time will the father keep us by his power? Until Christ comes for us. Until Christ comes for us. That's the rapture. Question five, why did the father seal each believer with the Holy Spirit? So we are kept and preserved in Christ. Okay, we move on. The rule of the son, very quickly. What did the son do to preserve us? We go to John chapter 5, verse 23, 24. That all men should honor the son, even as they honor the father. He that honoreth not the son, honoreth not the father which has sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me had everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. What's the Bible saying here? Very straightforward. If you don't honor Jesus, you are not honoring the Father. So talk about our Jewish friends who deny Jesus and talk down about Jesus, making wild claims in their Talmud that Jesus is in boiling excreta in hell. They are dishonoring the son. That means they are dishonoring the father also. Verse 24, Jesus said, if we hear his word and believe on the father, we have everlasting life or eternal life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. So when we receive everlasting life from Jesus, who is the giver of eternal life, we are passed from death unto life, and that comes from the Son of God. We shall not come into condemnation. We look at John chapter 6, verse 37 to 40. Listen carefully. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me. Listen carefully. That, all, that of all which he had given me, I should lose nothing but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. What is Jesus saying here? Jesus says, all that the Father has given unto him will come to him. In fact, in verse 44, Jesus says that, if the father does not draw someone, you cannot come to Jesus. So when the father draws you to Jesus, he will not cast you out. Verse 38. Why? Because he came to do the will of the father. Verse 39. What is the father's will? That of all which he had given me, Jesus, I should lose nothing. So that means when the Father gives you to Jesus, Jesus will make sure he doesn't lose you. And he will raise you up at the last day. What's the last day? That's the day he, Jesus, comes for us. 
the consummation of our union with God. Verse 40, and this is the will of the Father, that we see the Son, and we believe in the Son, and we have everlasting life, and he, Jesus, will raise us up at the last day, that he, Jesus, will lose no human being the Father gives him. That's what Jesus is doing. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 to 12, who has saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and had brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I believe, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day, that day of Christ. Once again, what is the Bible saying here? Very straightforward, verse 9. Jesus has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Why? Because that is the purpose of God. And that purpose of God was given to us in Christ before the world started. In Christ, the Son of God. The verse 10 is telling us Jesus has abolished death and brought life and immortality. What is life and immortality? We're talking about eternal life. It can never be destroyed. It can never be destroyed. That is eternal life that he, Jesus, gives us. So through the gospel, we have access to eternal life. That is the same as life and immortality. Paul says he's, he's a preacher, apostle, a teacher. The verse 12 is the kicker. He said, I'm persuaded that he, Jesus, is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. What does that mean? That Jesus is able to keep us until the very rapture time. Jesus has power to keep us. We look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 23 to 25. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continued forever, had an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he's able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever lived to make intercession for them. What is the Bible saying about Jesus here? He said there were many priests in the past and they couldn't continue because they died off. But Jesus continued forever. Why? Because he doesn't die. So the priesthood of Jesus cannot change. So if you have a friend who is a Jew, they're trying to build temple and have priests. What kind of priesthood is that one? Because the priesthood of Jesus will never change. That is, the order of Melchizedek will never change. So the priesthood order of Aaron is gone forever. Verse 25, Jesus is able to save them to the utter complete salvation. No, you are saved. You lose it the next day. No, he saves you completely. Why? Because Jesus ever lives to pray for you and for me. Because Jesus is praying for us. That's why we, we will not lose the salvation through him. We will not lose the eternal life through him. He is praying for us. His power is keeping us. Jude 24, 25. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, 
to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Let's break it down. Verse 24. What is Jesus able to do? He's able to keep you from falling. Eh? He's able to do that. Somebody say you lose your eternal life. No. Jesus is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his very presence. Why? Because that's why he came to die for us, so that we can partake of the eternal life of God and be absorbed into God. We will be raptured and we, we will share in his glory together. That's how powerful eternal life is. He's able to do that. Why? Because he, all glory belongs to Jesus. Majesty, dominion, power. That's why he's able to keep you and me from falling. Somebody say, no, Jesus cannot keep me from falling. Which Jesus are you talking about? Is it a Jesus in the scriptures? No, when he saves you, you cannot fall. If the person falls, it means they were not saved in the first place. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17, 18. Notwithstanding, the law stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Once again, what is the Bible saying here? 17, Jesus will never abandon us. He is told by Paul. Why? Because Jesus has a mission for Paul. He has a mission for every child of God. That's why he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you always. Jesus is with us always. Verse 18, he delivered Paul from an evil power and every evil work. And he will preserve Paul unto his heavenly kingdom. And somebody say, oh, you can lose your salvation. Sir, you were not saved in the first place. He will preserve you. That's who Jesus is, and that's what he does. Third reflection, question one, why does Jesus preserve all he gives eternal life to? Question two, why will not Jesus allow believers in him to perish? Question three, who can take a believer from the hands of Jesus? Question four, why is the life Jesus Christ gives called eternal life? Question five, why would Jesus present you faultless before his presence? Once again, you have one minute. Go. Okay, why does Jesus preserve all he gives eternal life to? He's not a liar. His will is, they shall never perish, period. Question two, why would not Jesus allow believers in him to perish? 
answer. His mission on earth will be destroyed if that happens. Question three, who can take a believer from the hands of Jesus? Nobody can do that. Why? Because he's the almighty. Question four, why is the life Jesus Christ gives called eternal life? Answer, that is God's own life, which is eternal and everlasting. Question five, why would Jesus present you faultless before his presence? Answer, that is his mission on earth, bring many sons to glory. Okay, last segment, the role of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at that. In preserving the child of God. Once again, John, we go to John 14, 16 to 18. And I'll pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. What is Jesus saying here? Jesus said he will pray the Father and the Father will give us, believers, another comforter. Who is the Holy Spirit and he will be with us forever. Not come and leave when the believer sins. No, the Holy Spirit is to be with us forever. He's never going to leave us. When you receive Jesus and the Holy Spirit comes, the Father will send the Holy Spirit into you. He doesn't go away forever. He will be with us forever. That is what Jesus is saying here. And verse 17, the Spirit of God was dwelling with them and shall be in them. And Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. That means Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one. Romans chapter 8, verse 26, 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helped our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Listen carefully. What does the Holy Spirit do? He helps with our infirmities. Infirmity means things we cannot do ourselves. There are needs we have, spiritual needs, to make sure we are kept in Christ that we are not aware of. But the Holy Spirit prays for us. So the first thing the Holy Spirit does to secure the eternal life we have is, is to pray for the believer. And he prays according to God's will. What is God's will? That Jesus does not lose you. So the Holy Spirit prays according to the will of God for your life. John 16, 13, and 14. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. What is the Bible saying about the Holy Spirit here? He guides believers into all truth. Whatsoever he hears within the Godhead, he shall speak. And whatever he hears that he shall speak, the Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus. So wherever the Holy Spirit is, his mission is to glorify Jesus. So if the person who is a child of God becomes selfish, they worship themselves. It's all about them. When the Holy Spirit is in control, the Holy Spirit will redirect the person's thinking, the person's mindset, the person's emotions. So they live to give glory to Jesus. 
all glory goes to Jesus. So the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth and will make sure our thinking, our emotions give glory to Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Romans 8, 12 and 4 to 14. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Listen very carefully. When you become a believer, you are not a debtor to the flesh to simply obey the flesh. The flesh wants to have sex. The flesh wants to go and get drunk. The flesh wants to be angry. The flesh wants to be selfish. You are not a debtor to do those things. But the verse 13 is the kicker. It says, for if ye live after the flesh, you will die. If you want to obey what the flesh is telling you, then you will die. But if ye through the spirit do kill, mortify means to kill, the deeds of the body, you shall live. So when I receive eternal life, by the power of the Spirit of God, I kill the deeds of the body. That is how the believer lives. So the Holy Spirit gives us power to kill sin and the deeds of the flesh. That is what proves you are led by the Spirit of God. When you are led by the Spirit of God, you're not going to be living after the flesh. So the very moment you begin to drift and shift to live after the flesh, it means the Spirit of God is not leading you. So by the Spirit of God, the believer receives power to kill the deeds of the body. That's why believers live holy, because of the Holy Spirit's power. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22, since ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Once again, I need for you to understand, the New Age Satanic Bibles, they will tell you this very verse, they've taken through the spirit, they've taken that out. But the Bible is making us aware that through the Holy Spirit, we purify our souls in obeying the truth. So the Holy Spirit gives us the power to obey the word of God so that our souls become pure. When someone's soul becomes pure, they love truly, genuinely. Not the world kind of love, but the love that comes from God. God, that is the nature of God's spirit. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, we purify our souls. We obey the word of God and we become more loving in God's way. Romans 8, 9 to 11. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. What is the Bible saying here? Verse 9. True children of God do not live in the flesh, but live in the spirit. Why? Because the spirit of God dwells in us. If someone doesn't have the Holy Spirit in them, he is none of his. That means the person doesn't belong to Jesus. Verse 10, if Christ is in us, the body is dead because of sin. What does that mean? When the body is dead, it is not responsive. Uh, 
whatever touches a dead body is a dead body. So when you are in Christ, and Christ is in you by the Holy Spirit, you become dead to sin. That means whatever temptations are coming out, it doesn't have effect on you. You see, by the Spirit, it's life because of righteousness. You become accustomed to, you are tuned to things of righteousness, sinful behaviors. It doesn't affect your life any longer. That's what the Bible is making us aware. So by the Holy Spirit, we become dead to sin. Temptations and living in the flesh, those things, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we do away with. And the Holy Spirit is the one who quickens our mortal bodies. That's what the Bible is making us aware. So when I become a child of God, I receive eternal life. By the power of the Spirit of God, I am preserved and kept in the faith. Our last reflection, question one, why does the Holy Spirit preserve the believer in Christ? Question two, why does Christ deposit his spirit in the believer? Question three, how do believers overcome the flesh and sin? Overcome the flesh and sin. Question four, why should the Holy Spirit redirect believers towards Christ? Question five, what is the power which keeps us in Christ? Once again, you have 60 seconds. Let's go. Amen. Okay, question one. Why does the Holy Spirit preserve the believer in Christ? The Spirit of Christ fulfill the mission of Christ. That's straightforward. And the mission of Christ is to bring many sons to glory by sharing the life of God with us. Question two. Why does Christ deposit his spirit in the believer? Answer, to ensure we abide in eternal life. Question three, how do believers overcome the flesh and sin? How do we overcome? How do we multiply the deeds of the flesh? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Question four, why should the Holy Spirit redirect believers towards Christ? So we will abide in eternal life as believers. Question five, what is the power which keeps us in Christ? Once again, the power of the Holy Spirit. With that, we come to the end. We shall begin a new series, The Fruit of the Spirit, beginning next week. Once again, God bless you. And please, don't forget to share this video with your friends. God bless you so much. Amen.